Now, this is going to be short presentation, perhaps 15 minutes or so. And I want to pick up on something which we left behind when we were discussing the third wave theology. And I'm interested in going back to that matter because some of you are asking uh, if you, we are not fighting the way that the third wave is proposing that we fight spiritual warfare, then what is spiritual warfare? What is spiritual warfare? And I think that's, that's, that's a very important question to answer because every time I attend, uh, and I do attend most of this because I'm invited to preach in these circles, and I believe it to be part of my calling to respond and to help uh, my brothers in Pentecostalism and Charismaticism to overcome, just like the Lord helped me to overcome. And so I, I'm frequently in these services, and because they surround us, you see, before a service begins, there is always a segment there in prayer where the leader is binding demons and cleansing the atmosphere, and so on and so forth. When we go to visit the sick, uh, the prayer is always a warfare, you know, uh, either binding demons and uh, cutting ancestral links and breaking curses and so on and so forth, binding and losing. And it does appear this idea of a warfare is so predominant in our minds, such that, in fact, if you are to remove the idea of spiritual warfare, people will begin to say, in fact, you're being unbiblical. And to some extent, yes, it is true. So if we are saying that is not spiritual warfare, what third wave theology is proposing to us, binding and losing, you know, ancestral spirit, territorial spirits, water spirits, and, and all these kind of shenanigans, if that's not spiritual warfare, then what is it? And I will tell you that in the mind of the Apostle Paul, spiritual warfare is surprisingly different from what we think it to be. Let us be sure, first of all, that the Bible calls us to a battle, to a war, and it's a spiritual kind of war. And that's what I began by saying, didn't I, uh, that in fact we must have a battle mindset. We must have a battle mindset. Yet, my friends, we may have a battle mindset, but be engaged in the wrong kind of war. I usually like to use the analogy of a hunter who goes out hunting a squirrel and in the process of chasing after the squirrel, sorry, an antelope, I beg your pardon, in the process of chasing after the antelope, a squirrel passes by and the hunter leaves the antelope, the main prize, and goes for the little squirrel. That's what usually happens in our lives when the enemy comes to us. He throws a diversion and we run after the diversion. He throws a red herring and we run after the red herring and we forget the main battle. So it is important for us to define what spiritual warfare really means. Now I say it is not in the binding and losing so-called. It is not in the territorial spirits and fighting of them in the spiritual mapping so-called. It is not in the praying on sight with insight, identification or repentance and stuff like that. Where is it? Let's read the Apostle Paul because I think he has very, very helpful words in this respect. And the reading then comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I want to begin it from verse 1, though we will center on verse 3 to verse 6. I want to begin from verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 to verse 6, but our emphasis will be from verse 3 to verse 6. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, that's the Apostle Paul, he doesn't come commanding, he doesn't come authoritatively or authoritarianly, I should say, but he comes gentle and meek like his Lord. Much unlike the today's apostles, much unlike them, but that's for another time. I appeal to you, can you see the language? 
I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold when away. Verse 2. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. We don't. Verse 3. So how do we live? For though we live in the world, I'm reading from NIV, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Some other translations will say, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage war after the flesh. Why? Verse 4. Why is our battle different? Why doesn't it look like what the world does? By the way, let me stop here for a moment. Years ago, there was a funny story on our television screens. In Mombasa, there's a school and I've preached there some years back. It was called Sacred Heart. It's a Catholic school, Sacred Heart. And apparently there was a demonic attack in that school and students were fainting and seeing strange vision and strange things. And guess who came to exorcise those demons? Imams and sheikhs with their Korans and reading them. Not Christians. What's my point? That in fact, even Muslims cast out demons. Even Muslims wage some kind of spiritual warfare. It's not biblical, it's not what we are talking about. Here in Western Kenya, we have people that use things that are called misambwa. Uh, they are witch doctors who can actually exorcise demons. We remember in Malawi, there was a Catholic priest called Father Milingo. Again, he shot to worldwide fame by exorcism, casting out demons. We know, for example, from my neighborhood, there, the, the, I, I minister in a neighborhood where there's a lot of Muslims. It's probably 70% Muslim, maybe more. And a lot of genies, and there was a time that there was an explosion of those things. And what happened was the sheikhs came and the sheikhs were going in every homestead casting out demons. So don't you think this is peculiar to third wave theology? This is the way the world does its things. But why are we different? Verse 4. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish, number one, strongholds. That's not what they're mighty for. To demolish, number one, what's the enemy? Strongholds. Now, in the Greek, the word stronghold, as Paul uses it there, is not what the third wave theology uses it to mean. The third wave theology uses the word stronghold to mean those, those pledges that were made by ancestors. Those rituals that were done that then caused some curses. Sometimes they talk about altars that were raised by certain tribal chiefs and certain uh, rites that were performed, certain scenes that are in the family line. They talk about strongholds in that sense. That's not the word Paul uses here. The word in the Greek here literally translates to a house of thoughts. A house of thoughts. These are thoughts, a system of education, a system of thinking, a system of learning, which have so ingrained themselves, so established themselves, that they have foundations and they are a house unto themselves. Paul says the weapons of our warfare are mighty in God, have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy such thoughts that have ingrained themselves. Thoughts, thoughts, thoughts. Strongholds are not what we think they are. In the language of Paul, they are strong thoughts, established thoughts, traditions, patterns. And those don't come out by prayer, my friends. There's only one way they come out. The antidote to ignorance is not prayer. The antidote to ignorance is not binding and losing, so-called. We'll explain what that word means later. The antidote to ignorance and to false information, to heresy and deception, is the truth of the gospel. 
And that is why Jesus says in John chapter uh, 8 and verse 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He didn't say, and you shall pray very much, and the prayer shall make you free. He said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What drives away darknesses of prayer is the light. So Paul, in thinking about spiritual warfare, sees the targets of our weapons as a house of thoughts. Secondly, he says, we demolish, again what? Get the word? Arguments. Isn't that amazing? Arguments. Not demons. Not witchcraft. Arguments. That's spiritual warfare in the mind of Paul. House of thoughts. Arguments. So we demolish arguments and what? And every pretension that self sets itself up Against what? Not authority. Well, that's included. Against what? Not rule so much, though that's implied, but against the knowledge of God. I'm jealous that you get the words. The targets of our weapons are house of thoughts. Number two, arguments. Number three, those things that rise against God's knowledge. God's kind of education. God's kind of information. This is where heresy would come in. This is where deception would come in. This is where apostasy comes in. Those things are the ones we are fighting. That's the spiritual warfare in the language of Paul. Against the knowledge of God. And then he ends verse 5 by saying, We take captive every what? Come on. Every what? Do we take captive? Every demon? No. Every territorial spirit, no. Every ritual, every altar, no. What do we take captive here? He says, we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Every thought. Every thought, dear friends. So when Paul thinks of spiritual warfare, he has these four things that he looks at as the target of our weapon. Our assault is to these targets. Number one, house of thoughts, strongholds. Number two, every argument. Number three, every pretension that sets itself up against what? God's knowledge. And then he says we are taking captive every thought. And bringing it to the obedience of Christ in verse 5. And we will be ready to punish Every act of disobedience, verse 6, once your own obedience is complete. Now, the word obedience presupposes instructions. So, in short, what am I saying? I'm saying to you that Paul, in thinking about spiritual warfare, he thinks of it as not being fought in the crusade arena. It's not being fought in, in the prayer walks. It's not being fought in the binding and losing. Paul thinks of it as being fought here. In the citadel of the mind. Let's put it bluntly and plainly. It's about information. We win or lose at the point of information. I don't care how many miracles you do. If you're deceived, you'll take people to hell. You probably will end up in hell yourself. Because it's here. My people perish for lack of knowledge. Remember, it's stronghold, house of thoughts, every argument, every pretension that sets itself up against what? The knowledge of God. And we take captive what? Every thought. And we punish what? Disobedience. Rebellion to God's revealed will. Once our own obedience, acceptance of revealed will is complete. This is spiritual Warfare, dear friends. We can engage in the side shows for as long as we want. The devil won't care. We can have as many miracles as we want. Which doctors can perform them? Hindus do them. Black magic do them. You can do that and you're in the same league. But there's one thing the devil cannot speak. The devil cannot speak the truth. He hates doctrine. 
And so spiritual warfare, true spiritual warfare, is fought in the realm of the mind. Information, doctrine, the truth of God's word is a battle for the truth. Love the truth. Scripture says, buy the truth and sell it not. Buy the truth and sell it not. That's spiritual warfare for you. Until next time, when you deal with those foundations that are based on the ignorance of the people of God, it's bye-bye from me, and may God bless you very much.